Welcome everyone to the first episode of the first season of the FIP CEO interviews. Thank you so much, Trevor, for making time for us in your busy agenda, especially during these strange COVID-19 times we're living in. I wanted to welcome you as our first guest on episode one of season one of these interviews. You're the first of 10 interviews I will run with global leaders and colleagues in pharmacy and healthcare, where we seek to explore your journey, your experiences, and the impact of those experiences on your professional practice. Trevor, I was in to start these discussions and interviews after our conversation with FIP President Dominique Jourdan, where we discuss the development of a vaccine and treatment and the complexities therein for COVID-19, and where you shared your experiences with AZT in the 80s and 90s and how invaluable those lessons have been for now. This inspired me, and I reflected on how important it is for our pharmacy leaders to be able to share that insight, to be able to share the experiences when things go super well, and when they don't quite go to plan and what we learn from both experiences. So I'm so proud to interview you today in the first of the FIP CEO interviews. Can't wait to share some insights with our profession and maybe some life lessons too. I'm looking, looking forward to learning from you. We aim to take around 30 minutes of your time, but Trevor, before we get to the professional elements of the interview, I just want to welcome you. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure. Wonderful. I would like to start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start, as the song goes. I note from your biography, Trevor, that you attended Wolverhampton Grammar School. So this means you're from the Midlands of England in the UK for our uh, non-UK residents. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and where your inspiration for choosing your career came from? Yes, my father was moving his career, eventually became uh, uh, director of... Um, Corona, a soft drinks company, not the one with the virus. And he was manager of a, a factory in, in Wolverhampton. I went to Wolverhampton Grammar and then he moved to London and I went to school there and um, eventually got into um, Chelsea College School of Pharmacy, which has now become King's College. And I've been visiting professor there for 30 odd years. So uh, moved around a bit and then moved when I finished my uh, pharmacy uh, undergraduate degree, did my PhD and postdoc at Chelsea, and then moved to Nottingham as a lecturer, so back to the Midlands. So lots of full circles there for you, Trevor, mm -hmm. and obviously some inspirations along the way, and I note that nice link with Chelsea College all the way through. Um, so it would take me an entire interview slot today to detail your entire career's achievements. But I've been looking at your biography, uh, Trevor, and it's so impressive and full of achievements, notably your leadership, teamwork, and invention. You mentioned you're a visiting professor at King's, and we note that you're a former head of R&D at Wellcome. You've also had um, an awful lot of experience with governments, uh, attracting inward investments, negotiations on pharmaceutical price regulation schemes, advising the Wales governments and the future of the NHS, and you maintain a very active life in um, life science investment funds, etc. You're also a key member of our, the FIP, FIP COVID-19 Expert Advisory Group, providing us with regular updates and advice across industry. That's really notable. Many of the lessons we learn along the way in our careers don't just come from our successes. Trevor, what would you consider to be the three biggest lessons of your career? I suppose the initial one is realising who I really am and what I am capable of doing and what I'm not capable of doing. I, I went to a leadership course at Oxford, which Margaret Thatcher had set up when she was Prime Minister. And that gave me an insight into the reality of what I could achieve and the characteristics that go with that in terms of leadership. So that was really important uh, lesson for me to understand uh, myself. I suppose the next point would be um, ne needing regularly to review the objectives and the mission that you're on. If you're running a company or you're running a, an organization, it's very important to not assume that what you did yesterday is fit for purpose for tomorrow. 
So actually having a very, very objective, regular review of where you're going and having critics within the organization who are constructive, I think is really, really important. And then I suppose that the most important one is um, learning by mistakes. Um, you're right, I was uh, leading the team that developed the first drug for HIV AIDS, AZT Retrovir, and we had um, intellectual property rights covering that drug. And suddenly we found that um, a company in South Africa was supplying the drug, uh, infringing our patents. So what did I do? Prosecuted the Mandela government because I was correct and it was, it was absolutely legally correct, but it was the wrong thing to do. And, um, you know, we had to then work with the government to establish how we could maintain supplies to people in need. But I think it's important to reflect on something like that and say, why did I really make that decision? And was that the right way to go forward? And it clearly wasn't. So learning from mistakes, very important. That's so important. I think those three uh, messages, I'm going to note them down for myself. Know thyself, know where you're going and learn from your mistakes as you go. Um, a, a real level, a real sense of humility there, Trevor. Thank you so much. I think probably turning that on its head then, I noted that, um, and you mentioned it yourself, you were involved in the introduction of HIV, AIDS, drugs, AZT, and its prizing and, and liaison with South African governments. What would you say are your three biggest achievements to date? Well, certainly becoming the global R&D director for Wellcome was, you know, undoubtedly something I hadn't expected. Um, I was head of development there at Wellcome uh, as a pharmacist. Um, I'd been head of development at the Boots Company in Nottingham, was headhunted to Wellcome and then started to run the bro broader side of development, including chemical, analytical and so on. And suddenly Sir John Vane, uh, left and I was asked to become R&D director and that was quite interesting because I hadn't been prepared for that and that was gave me the chance to restructure the organization and build it to the success we had. Um, really important medicines that we developed. I suppose the next achievement which I'm extremely proud of is that I was honoured by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth uh, 10 years ago nearly now uh, with the award of the um, uh, commander of the British Empire, the CBE, and that was in recognition of what they said was my significant contribution to pharmaceutical science and industry. And I'm very proud of that um, because it reflected, I think, not just on um, what I'd achieved, but particularly on what the position of the industry was in contributing to the health and wealth of our nation. And I suppose the other award that uh, really I valued is the Scrip Lifetime Award for Lifetime Achievement. Scrip is the magazine that regularly reports on the industry and I was the first recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award. I was very proud of that too. So you should be. Trevor, those are amazing achievements. My goodness me, most people can only mention one if they've had a successful career and you seem to have a litany of them. I'm also really interested in the um, in the way in which as a pharmacist you have focused on drugs to enable health and wealth of nations and I, I'm really interested, um, we'll explore that a little bit later in, in the interview, but I'm really interested in um, some of the things you would give as a top tip for people starting out on their career. Um, really fantastic. I mean, the, these things all flow into one, don't they? Things that you have um, been recognized for, things that you have achieved, and then things you are most proud of. Um, it's very interesting um, when we look at what we've achieved along the way, um, but also what we're most proud of. What would you say are the three things that you're most proud of? Well, going back to my life at the Wellcome Foundation and being Global R&D Director, um, leading the team there that developed um, and discovered and developed really significant drugs. Uh, you, I mentioned HIV, AIDS, ACT. Um, but malarone for malaria particularly was a, a, a significant advance. And then drugs like lamotrigine for epilepsy and Zovirax for herpes infections, which, um, you know, have, effect, have influenced and benefited millions of people worldwide. And if you're at the front line of pharmacy or medicine, of course, you're dealing with a patient directly. Those of us who have been in our kind of research and development environment don't quite often see that, but the benefit we produced 
that way is something I'm very, very proud of indeed. And leading the team that were there was really important. Interesting, Catherine, that um, the leadership role is very much something which people talk about, but very few people truly understand. Um, I've always felt that my role has been a coach, if I can use a sporting analogy, rather than a manager. I'd much rather be there assisting people to do well on the field than trying to make decisions off the field about the future of the team. And I think that was the case of my team at Welcome with those drugs that I've mentioned. I suppose the next big one was from the work we did in malaria, um, being a founder of the Medicines for Malaria Venture. This is a not-for-profit organization which Bill and Melinda Gates funded originally and many governments have come in si since. And it was to discover and develop entirely new drugs for malaria, which had to be cost less than a dollar and cure within three days. Because in the developing world, people simply couldn't afford uh, the major drugs we were producing for the developed world. And that's now had its 20th anniversary. It's got a wonderful portfolio of new drugs that will see a big change in the uh, lives of people as long as they can get access to them. And that is a problem. I suppose the third thing would be that because I was R&D director at Wellcome, I had conversations with other R&D directors at the other big companies, Merck, Pfizer, Glaxo at the time, and so on. And I decided to bring them together uh, to discuss how we could work collaboratively, pre-competitively, um, no cartels, but do things together in partnership that could speed the time of um, getting products to the market and reduce attrition. And we met at a castle in England called Hever Castle, where Anne Boleyn lived and Henry VIII used to court her there. And we called it the Hever Group. And that's been running for 25 years. And we've set up immensely valuable coordinating groups on genomics and on many different subjects, and most recently um, on COVID-19. And the, the work we're doing together to actually collaborate, to share data, to share information, uh, to share technologies is an incredible example of how the industry working with academia and governments can make a real significant difference. So that HEVA group has been something I'm very proud of. I think all of those um, three uh, examples, um, not only are they hugely humbling, Trevor, but they're all, they're all testament to your character and personality. One about, you know, coaching and not managing a team, bringing out the best in people, identifying their strengths seems to be something that drives you. And the idea that, you know, this, this we're in the 20th anniversary of um, the, the work that you've done, you've done with the Gates Foundation, um, really is about how we can give back and identify in communities that have greater need than us, how we might be able to deliver innovations. The thing I'm really, um, I mean, I'm really proud of you for those things, but the thing I'm really uh, impressed by is bringing together corporations and organizations that usually are in competition with each other around a shared aim. And that seems to culminate, you know, the, the two other examples that you've given. Um, and look at the work that they're doing now. I mean, this is, I hadn't known that this was uh, set up some time ago, but I think what's been so impressive as a pharmacist and uh, working in a global organization is watching how we see our academic communities and our um, corporate pharmaceutical industries working shoulder to shoulder to try and identify therapeutic solutions um, and also treatments and vaccines for what we're in at the moment and this is seismic so I mean this is an off off our interview but Trevor what would you say um, what would you say has motivated them is it the shared ambition for um, finding a solution to this because we're in a global pandemic and a global problem or do you think there's also an undercutting of what the future might hold if you do start these partnerships what's your sense of, of what's driving them to collaborate like this well the heva group um a few years ago felt that pandemic preparedness would be a very essential part of our work and indeed many presidents of the united states and ministers here have been saying the same but it only took it's only recently that the world has got that together but there was already then a, a feeling that we could do things together that actually you could get spin-offs as well if you understand more about the biology of a virus like um, Ebola 
and um, SARS, then you can use that knowledge in many different areas of, of uh, virology, but also in other areas of, of uh, disease. So it was valuable to share understanding and techniques um, that could address a particular need. And you, you, as you say, it's become very uh, pronounced how we've been able to work together for the COVID-19 pandemic, but equally to use that data, uh, which was pre-competitive in our own way to actually develop entirely new therapies. So the take home from that really is that if you can work with colleagues in partnership, collaboratively, pre-competitively, it will be to your advantage down the line as well. And I think that's a real take home lesson for perhaps some of the more entrepreneurial types in our profession or those who work in corporates. Working... That we might see the same emerge for um, antimicrobial resistance. Yeah. I mean, there's likely yeah. to be a continuing problem there. There's likely to be not much profit in any solution. But I think with all the work we're doing together, we could see that being another initiative as soon as we have uh, cracked this one. Hopefully we won't have a, an immediate crisis for me to come back and interview you again around AMR just yet. But um, I look forward to, to talking to you again in the future about that. So Trevor, as you think about the, the journey you've been on from um, Wolverhampton, starting there and ending up there, and then also your journey through Kings, etc., um, I've got some questions here about what are the three top tips you'd give to the next generation? This could be some young pharmacists, some young pharmaceutical scientists. Uh, it could be people mid-career thinking about changing or moving on to the next uh, role. Uh, what would be your three top tips for them? If, you, if somebody had given you them, that, that would have changed your, your perspective. Well, I think um, the first one is don't underestimate your ability. I think my motto on my crest, my crest the Queen awarded me, I've, got, I've created potest qui se posse confidet, Latin, and it says you can achieve it if you're confident you can do it. You know, when my team was working on the AIDS virus, we never doubted that we would find a drug to hit the virus. We never doubted it. And it was the confidence that we had there that led us forward. At the same time, of course, as my mother used to say to me, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I think balancing, if you will, the ability to understand that you can achieve things must be tempered by that decision about when it's appropriate not to. So that's the first one. I suppose for me, it's been very important to keep learning, to keep on getting more information broadly based from different areas to fulfill the kind of objectives that you need uh, in the particular direction you're traveling. Um, you know, it's like when you get a degree, it's not a pot that's filled and a lid put on it. It's, as somebody said, a fire that has been lit, which you can add fuel to. And adding that fuel and maintaining knowledge and growing knowledge is really, really important, I think, uh, for your future. And uh, the last one, I suppose, is setting some goals for a limited period of time. I've always felt that a three to five year horizon is something I should be relatively confident of looking to. Anything beyond that, you know, the world changes, you change. But if you could design your life and your activities within the sort of three to five year time frame and then review them, well, with my time at Welcome, it went on for years and years, but at least it was looking at it in those little segments to make sure that I wanted to be where, do something I enjoyed, that I thought was valuable, and uh, that would be my three advice areas. I think that's fantastic. Some of the things that we get asked about um, at FIP um, are around people who are mid-career, um, Trevor. Now you mentioned you were welcome for a very long time. We have a lot of um, colleagues who ask for advice really, a bit of mentorship, who say things like, um, I, I feel like I've lost my confidence a bit. Perhaps if they've started a family, perhaps, there's been a move, uh, one person in the family has had to move for a job and the other person doesn't find themselves so settled. Did, did you ever have an experience where mid-career you had to almost pull, pull those three points out that you had to think about, where's my three to five year plan, you know, keep on learning, don't underestimate, you can achieve it. Did you have to do that to yourself at any point in your career? Or what would be your advice to somebody who finds themselves at that point? Well, 
most fortunately, the doors that opened, I hadn't realised were going to be there, even uh, let alone open. So uh, the decisions I had to take were ones in a positive direction rather than be uncertain about the next stage of, of travel. But I do think for people who are mid-career, um, it is really important that they understand that life is not, um, you know, it's not a rehearsal. I mean, you're on stage now and you only come this way once and you better actually turn around and say, what's important to me? My family, my, my, my leisure time uh, and where is my career headed? And it may not be uh, upwards. Um, it may be something you have to come to terms with. So I think that's really important um, that it's realizing that this is where you are now and you better live with it and get on with it. Very good, very good advice. And sometimes a sideways step is a, a bit of a change that's needed. That's all that's needed, really. Yeah. Indeed. Well, Trevor, we're on our last question now. And to end our interview and gain, gain even more insight, if you'll allow us, into your tips and tricks, we've all had to change our habits and ways of working in recent times during this COVID crisis, no matter where we are in the world. Um, most of us have essentials that we have to um, deploy daily, whether that be coffee or whether that be um, a celebratory gin and tonic at the end of the day. What have been your three essentials in your working life or especially through COVID? Yeah, um, certainly maintaining a very good record of things, uh, filing it electronically nowadays, but actually making sure that you don't lose the information. I think that really is critical. Uh, one's memory as one gets older isn't as good as it was when one's younger but equally needing to go back I mean I was uh, when I was talking to you about the Covid stuff recently I was remembering the time that I was uh, president of the International FIP Commission on Technology and on the board of pharmaceutical sciences for many years and I gave the FIP Millennium Conference lecture in San Francisco at the Millennium 2000 and I, I've got that record. I could go back and look at that and remember those wonderful times, but pick from that some of the lessons that actually we're talking about today. Uh, certainly keeping fit, uh, really, really important, mentally and physically. In my case, uh, each day I try and spend an hour or so in the garden uh, fighting the weeds. Um, but keeping fit mentally and keeping fit physically is really, really critical. And lastly, I guess, just listening to others. You know, don't believe that everything you think is right. Uh, be objective. There's a lot of false news and fake news out there, but listening to others and distilling from them lessons and distilling from them information is absolutely critical. That's so true, isn't it? I love the analogy of weeding. It's almost, you know, you do it physically and um, mentally as well with your good records tip as well and the listening to others. I don't know about you, Trevor, but during these times of remote working and a lot of uh, Zoom calls, other platforms do exist, the art of listening is even more important as we try and fill the meetings with lots of words. It's really, really important. Um, on that note, I have absolutely loved listening to you and your stories. I've got notes here and I look forward to revisiting this um, interview. Uh, your generosity in sharing some of the personal accounts has been great. Um, and I really love it. And it's going to become my mantra. Know thyself, know where you're going and learn from your mistakes. That's going to become my coaching tips to my team. I'll look back at the San Francisco Millennial Lecture as well, Trevor, and um, seek to learn more about what you were saying then. And then we can take a a trip back and forth as we have our conversations about COVID-19. Trevor, that's a huge pleasure and an honour to spend a few minutes with you and share your insights and your thoughts and your journey to date. Well, it's been Thank my you so pleasure. much. And I just want to recognise the incredible work that pharmacists are doing, uh, members of FIP globally, uh, during these very, very difficult times. They are frontline troops and they deserve our congratulations, respect and thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Trevor. And they do do us proud, as do you. Thanks a million. Mm -hmm.